You are a screenwriter tasked with bringing a story to life. You've watched a lot of movies and TV shows in your day, so you know all the tried and true tropes that pervade the digital visual medium. Naturally, you don't want your show or movie to be predictable and boring. So what do you do? You subvert the audience's expectations. After carefully setting up a routine plot development or character arc, you pull the rug out from under your viewers with a twist that no one could have seen coming, proving your creative genius to the world. I say that with sarcasm and sincerity intermingled. Expect Expectation subversion has gotten a bad rap in the past decade or so, after movies like The Last Jedi and Iron Man 3 pulled gotchas on the audience that felt mean-spirited, like they were just meant to crush the hopes and dreams of viewers that showed up expecting an uplifting and inspiring space opera or superhero film. However, there is something to be said for subverting expectations. When done well, these twists grab the audience's attention and keep us invested in the story. They announce, hey, this is different. Forget what you thought you knew we're taking you to uncharted territory. So what makes for good or bad expectation subversion? Let's examine a few examples from everyone's favorite movie and learn a lesson from the most pleasantly surprising Netflix show. Again, I'm mixing sarcasm and sincerity to answer that question. I'm going to subvert all of your expectations by starting out with an example of good expectation subversion from The Last Jedi. They were nobody. They were filthy junk traders. If you were on the internet any time between 2015 and 2017, you could not avoid seeing theories about where Rey had come from, who her parents were, what her heritage was, and so forth. There was no shortage of fan theories ranging from simple to complex, from completely normal to bat crazy, guessing that she was anything from Obi-Wan's granddaughter to a clone made from Luke's severed hand. Almost all of these theories are better than the puke-inducing canon that The Rise of Skywalker gave to us, but that's beside the point. What is the point is that basically every Star Wars fan with access to a keyboard had at one time or another typed out his or her theory on who spawned Rey. But I don't know that anyone predicted her parents being irrelevant. I mean, I'm sure someone did, but it wasn't exactly a popular theory. I would bet good money that Ryan Johnson knew this, and that's at least part of the reason he had Ray's parents be nobodies. He wanted to surprise the fans, to tell us this isn't the Star Wars you knew, and in this one instance, I think it actually works well. Here's why. Rey's parents didn't need to be significant characters in the Star Wars universe. Rey was fully capable of having a strong character arc regardless of who birthed her. She did not have a strong character arc, but again, that's beside the point. Having one of her parents be Obi-Wan and Satine's kid, for example, would have been little more than a fun Easter egg for the portion of the fan base who watched Clone Wars. There was no real reason to make Rey the child of an established character, other than fans tend to love it when one property within the universe references another property, a fact Disney knows well Hence the constant member berries, or ripoffs depending on how generously you view them, in their Star Wars properties. Rather than appealing to our insatiable appetite for references, Ryan made Rey's parents worthless losers and caught us off guard in the process. But his trickery alone is not what made this moment good. Subverting expectations is never good or bad in its own right. Instead, this revelation was impactful because it enforced the idea that the Star Wars galaxy is incomprehensibly huge, and the meaningful and powerful characters who take part in the movements that shape the galaxy do not all need to be related. The ability to use and be in tune with the Force is not something exclusively passed down along bloodlines like it's the divine right to rule. Any being on any planet could be a Jedi. This is an idea the movie reinforces with its final shot. It's an uplifting, inspiring theme that is honestly at odds with so much of the rest of the movie, but more on that later. In this instance, The Last Jedi takes our narrow-minded thinking about the characters and our assumptions about how these stories usually go and flips them on their heads. The film subverts audience expectations here in a way that broadens how we view this universe, that enforces the idea that there's more to the Star Wars galaxy than Kenobi's Skywalkers and their closest associates. With this message of hope, The Last Jedi allows for a more expansive story by declining to give the main character a notable bloodline and refusing to yield to a common trope. That brings me neatly along to Arcane, a show that, by its third episode, appeared to be sticking to what I lovingly dub the Avatar trope. In this trope, you have a group of young, plucky adventurers and or misfits who are trying to make their way in the world, fighting against overwhelming odds and the powers that be, and often receiving advice from an experienced, wizened old veteran or two. This is a common trope for a reason. It's almost universally appealing. The small band of heroes allows for fun interpersonal dynamics without a ridiculous number of relationships to keep track of, a lesson the writers of Eternals clearly hadn't learned. 
Additionally, viewers love underdog stories, so forcing your protagonists to overcome differences and bond as a team to win the day against seemingly impossible odds is a surefire way to win over your audience. It certainly seemed like Arcane was moving in that direction. The first two episodes established Vi and Powder as the two main characters, with Milo and Clagger rounding out the team but not having a central roles. We also got introduced to the world of Piltover and Zahn, learned about the long-lasting struggle between the two cities, and we have begun to see how the kids may fit into that struggle, or even how their actions may incite a new war altogether. And then, our expectations get flipped on their heads, tossed out the window, and shattered into a million pieces. When Vander is captured, we would expect the group to set out to rescue him, despite the odds being stacked against them, as they usually are. And the team does just that, except there's a hitch. Powder, deemed unready by Vi, who thus far had been her stalwart defender, is forced to stay behind. Determined to prove her worth anyway, Powder shows up with some new toys whose power she grossly underestimates, and she blows up our expectations along with the warehouse and her friends. The deaths of Milo, Clagger, and Vander are sudden and shocking. What should have been were Arcane to stay true to the trope, a mission that strengthened the bond between the members of the group, was instead a catastrophic disaster that violently tore it apart. Vin and Powder are separated, their friends are dead, their mentor gone, and the message is clear. This show is different. This is not the story we expected it to be. Forget what you thought you knew, forget your preconceived notions that you've developed through years of watching fantasy and anime. We're taking you on a journey you have not experienced before. At least, that's how it felt to me. Maybe some of you saw something like this coming, but man did it take me by surprise. It caught my attention. It showed that the creators of Arcane were willing to explore and experiment, to take risks. They absolutely could have written a story in which the group slowly learns and grows as they struggle, fight, and survive, and it probably would have done well. It would have felt familiar, reminding us of some other beloved shows, and executives love it when they can get consumers to feel nostalgic. Instead, Arcane's creators bucked that trend, throwing caution to the wind and disregarding our expectations, ditching them, like this story ditched Milo and Clagger, and forging ahead with their own unique vision. It made us sit up straight to put down our phones and actually watch the story unfold. By daring to do so, it subverted our expectations, grabbed our attentions, and never let go, delivering one gripping episode after the other. Powder's calamitous, destructive method of helping was a bold stroke by Arcane that set it apart in a way that engaged the audience and drove the story forward in an unusually gripping fashion. It was, in a word, brilliant. Unfortunately, not all such attempts to subvert expectations can match that standard. The Last Jedi subverted our expectations in several unpleasant ways, making Poe an overly aggressive, short-sighted jackass who had to be put in his place by an unestablished character who was his superior in every way, relegating Finn to a side character in an inane, preachy side plot, and of course, reinventing Luke as a bitter, despondent has-been who had to be dragged kicking and screaming back into the fight. I don't think I need to go into great detail about how horrible of a decision that last subversion was. Ryan Johnson's treatment of one of the most beloved cinematic protagonists of all time has been trashed from one pole to the other, and while I certainly could pile onto the heap, I'll restrain myself. Somewhat. I'll merely point out that Luke, when we, and by we I mean the normies, the casual Star Wars fans who never got much into the EU, last saw him at the end of Return of the Jedi, he was on a path toward greater enlightenment, the restoration of the Jedi Order, toward becoming a great Jedi and a wise teacher. The next thing we know, he's tossing his dad's lightsaber over his shoulder. That's a pretty sudden drop in Luke's character arc, one that left the audience stunned and confused, wondering, how did this happen? Technically, we do get an explanation, but it's so contrived and out of character that it really only serves to make things worse. The man who saw the good in his father, a villain who was complicit in the deaths of billions, believed that his nephew could not be saved because he saw some darkness in him. Those two characters are incongruous. The same goes, though to a lesser extent, for Finn and Poe. You thought these were capable, thoughtful, upright characters? Psych! They get put in their places, outwitted and enlightened, by newly introduced characters who just so happen to tick a certain box. This doesn't sting as much as Luke's character assassination, and indeed, if it weren't for Luke's treatment, we might have hardly noticed Finn and Poe getting sidelined and mistreated. They had only been present for one movie so far, after all, but... Luke did in fact suffer an assassination of character, and thus served to highlight Finn and Poe's treatment as part of a larger theme. 
this type of expectation subversion is bad because it undermines what the audience rightly knows to be true. It undermines the story of its own universe. It is one thing to see where an audience's mind would naturally go as you are creating the characters and plot and then take them in a different direction, avoiding the trap of becoming predictable and boring. It is quite another to grab a beloved character who has been set on a path, rudely shove him off that path and over a cliff, then make him climb up from the bottom of the ravine, but he's only able to because your new hero comes along and throws him a lifeline. In the first instance, audience expectations were established by their knowledge of the genre, or just TV and cinema as a whole. In the second case, the expectations were very intentionally set by the story itself, which is why the subversion feels so wrong. It makes the audience feel that they have been suckered in and lied to, and that's a pretty terrible feeling. Writers should strive to surprise their audiences. We enjoy unexpected plot twists unforeseen character developments, and unexpected changes in the world. These elements keep the story fresh, grab our attention, and engage us. We love to say, whoa, I did not see that coming, or better yet, ha, I totally predicted that when the person we're watching with did not. But this needs to be done with care, minding what audience expectations are, and if they have a right to those expectations because the story has clearly established them. If Jinx were to abruptly revert back to Powder, the little girl who blindly and totally trusts her sister, when she was finally reunited with Vi, that would subvert audience expectations, but it would do so in a way that is jarring and unearned. Abrupt character deviations need to be earned through careful setup. You can't just throw them into your audience faces with the message, accept it or get out. Well, I mean, you can, you just run the risk of disenfranchising a huge portion of your core audience, which is exactly what Disney did with Star Wars, while Arcane exploded into the public consciousness and captured hearts. This despite, or maybe because of, the fact that, like the sequel trilogy, Arcane featured a strong female lead, but those are thoughts for another time. So what do you think? Did Arcane subvert your expectations, or were you one of the perceptive few who was on to all their tricks? Do you think Luke's character is perfectly developed and I'm a moron for not seeing it? Either way, I want to hear your thoughts and ideas down below. Thank you for watching.